this is the process I believe is what's going on with our radar systems and uh, the seismicity uh, following along the lines of Yellowstone I believe that since the radars sit on opposite sides of, of Yellowstone that they're able to penetrate them one acting as a receiver the other acting as a transmitter and that's why we're getting these odd signals uh, on the seismographs and increased activity also I believe this same principle is being transferred into fracking uh, the ability to use uh, the microwave energy the, the uh, radio frequencies to, to move media. If we look at areas uh, that have uh, magnetic principles to them, then they can adapt these uh, radar systems to actually use the magnetic fields that are around naturally occurring in certain areas of the United States. And I believe they're able to move this media instead of using uh, the the fracking material now that that's being outlawed and people are up in arms with it I do believe that they're moving to technology to solve this problem because they have so much money invested in it and I think we're seeing the byproduct of, of those tests or or the application um, so if you'd watch this short uh, little video it'll help explain what I'm talking about. This is from MIT. It's a rather older video, um, but I was able to come across it, so that's what I'm using in in this aspect. It's in a visual evidence for molecular polarization. set in a shallow dish of corn oil, which is then placed in a nitrogen pressure chamber. 25 kilovolts AC is applied. Polarization forces push the fluid upward between the plates. The field intensity is greatest at the left, about 100 kilovolts per centimeter. The height of rise is inversely proportional to the square of the radial distance. If you see here, it says electronic field and moving media. Uh, media being uh, any element, mass, uh, fluid. Uh, it, that's what they're discussing there. Okay, in this next video, uh, it's older and we have far better technology now uh, but bear with me through this and it'll explain um, another part of the application and another byproduct of the application I believe that they're using now uh, and it'll better illustrate why we might be hearing these booms and what is going on in our earth all of a sudden because of the technology that we possess today on a larger scale granted um, but bear with me on this and uh, it may help explain a few more things Edgerton's boomer illustrates the induction of a current in a conductor subjected to a time varying magnetic field and the associated magnetic forces it illustrates the interplay between the laws of Faraday ampere and ohm that determines the distribution, duration, and magnitude of currents in conductors under magneto-quasi-static conditions. This of a spark gap, which we just heard. We can see it if we open this panel.
The switch is closed by a spark. Cross this gap. That spark is activated by applying a voltage to this electrode to make a smaller electrical breakdown in the gap. Just once, we'll bypass the safety interlock that ordinarily disconnects the circuit when the panel is opened. So that you can see evidence of the field that you can't feel firsthand. Let's replace his hand by this wire loop. The wire is open at this point, with the ends barely touching. So the field induced around the contour is concentrated at the gap. We go to a higher f-stop to protect the camera. The integral of the electric field intensity is concentrated in a gap region that is initially relatively insulating. So the electric field intensity between the almost touching wires is enough to produce a spark. The conductivity of this aluminum disc is more than 10 million times larger than for human flesh. And there's no gap to limit the induced current. The force can be used to shape metals. Here, the upward force is evident in the shaping of the outer edge of a foil disc. For this experiment, we used three times as much capacitance. If the force can be used to shape the metal, it can also be used to launch the disc. I'm Melcher, and as you know, that's Zahn. We've brought along an illuminary here to push that button, finally. This is Professor Doc Edgerton, and uh, it's his machine. What we've done, of course, is to show you this disc. And now, if, uh, Doc, you turn on your machine. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to step out of this. I'll turn on the main power. Let it come up to charge. <laughs> Hooray! I'll do it again. Do you have a favorite one there? <laughs> well, the, uh, everyone's a little different. Let's try this one. What do you say? Power. A little different ring to it. A little different ring. Now, as I understand it, this thing's got uh, more capacitors in it. Maybe we get Zahn to uh, put a little more in yeah, there? Yeah, you like to have a little yeah, more? Yeah, sure. one okay. of the reasons I brought this man along is that, uh, in fact, he mainly paid for this building. So, you see, we don't care too much if we hurt that ceiling. It'd be nice to have an imprint up there, wouldn't it? Right. With you here, I can say that. Okay, let's see what happens this time. Well, you got three capacitors on instead of one. You should go a little higher. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Hooey! <laughs> Missed me. <laughs> Want to try our favorite? Yeah, let's try that one. <laughs> hey, knocked a hole in the ceiling. Okay. Well, I see you enjoy that, huh? Now, that illustrates... Uh, the principles of what I'm talking about. Um, if you'll bear with me through part two, I'll explain more.